Welcome to this video lecture. We're going to begin today talking about transient conduction. And specifically, we're just going to do a conceptual introduction today. So the word transient means how something changes with time. So previously, everything we've done up to this point has been focused on steady state conduction. So we're going to introduce this new element of temperature changing with time in this lesson. And I want to begin just by talking about a thought experiment. So imagine that you have a building that in the wintertime is left with no heat for several days and the building and the walls and the air reach a, a thermal equilibrium at 5 degrees C. So the room air and all through the wall are all 5 degrees C. So let's say someone comes in and they turn the heat on in both of these rooms and we'll assume that that heater in each room heats up the air really really quickly so it basically immediately gets up to 30 degrees C and that air is going to be well mixed which basically means we don't have to really worry about what's happening so much with the air other than that air is going to be convecting heat into the wall from both sides. So imagine that we do have this wall, let's say that it's made out of oak, which is a wood, and it's 10 centimeters thick, and this separates the two rooms. So under this circumstance, someone comes in, they flick on the heat, those rooms get hot really fast, but the wall doesn't necessarily get hot. Um, answer the following questions. So how do the temperature and flux profile look like at t equals zero? t equals zero meaning that's the moment you switch on the heat. And I'll give you a second just to think about it. You might want to pause. Okay, so if this is should be an easy one, if we were to zoom in on this wall and we plotted temperature versus x of just the wall itself, you would expect that everything is at thermal equilibrium, which means it's all at the same temperature. This implies that there's no heat transfer because everything is at the same temperature. There's no driving force for heat transfer. So we'd be at five degrees just all the way through the wall and then the same for both rooms. The flux profile would be similar. It would be constant all the way through. And I mentioned that if there's no driving force for heat transfer, we're going to have to put a zero on here. There is no flow of heat because there's no there are no temperature gradients. Everything is all the same temperature. Okay, so let's say we let our system sit with the heat on, and we wait for two solid days. So at t equals 48 hours after the heat has been on, and both rooms are at 30 degrees C, what do the temperature and flux profile look like in that case? And again, I'll give you a second if you want to pause and think about it. So again, if we were to plot temperature and flux, our temperature would now reach a new thermal equilibrium, which is also a steady state. So a thermal equilibrium implies steady state, uh, whereas you can have a steady state without a thermal equilibrium. And I will explain that in a later lecture. So we would now just expect our temperature to raise. So it would be at a uniform 30 degrees C, and again, because we're at thermal equilibrium, our flux is still going to be zero at that moment. So we'd expect after two days for a wall that is only 10 centimeters thick that it would reach a steady state by that point. So how do the temperature and flux profile look like at t equals 10 minutes? So basically we have a steady state here, and we're pretty sure that two days later we're going to have a new steady state here. But what happens in between as we're going from one steady state to another? So I'll give you some time to think about it. OK, so there's got to be some transition. So we're going to see this curve start to move upward until eventually it turns into that curve. So that's what transient conduction is all about, is how do we analyze what happens in between these different steady states. When you make a change to your system and disrupt that equilibrium, your temperature profile will evolve. So we want to be solving the heat equation in these cases to figure out how does temperature change with respect to distance, but also with time. So uh, you may think that, so let's think this one through a little bit. Um, we'll do a blue for this in between. So you, so heat's going to start to penetrate because that convection happens instantaneously. If you turn up the heat to 30 in the room and the wall is still at 5, you're going to get flux coming in from the left, 
but you're also going to get flux coming in from the right, and that would be a negative flux because it's going against our coordinate system. Because that flux is going to hit the edges of the wall first, you're going to see these temperature gradients start to form. So after about 10 minutes, so it might just look like that. So you're going to see these spatial gradients. So energy is hitting these outer edges by convection first. So we're getting convection happening here at the edges, but still in the center, there's still no temperature gradient. So there's no driving force for heat transfer yet. That gradient starts to form because of convection coming in because of the delta T between the air and the left side of the wall, and then only as the temperature starts to elevate in the solid itself do you start to see this temperature gradient form. So heat will start penetrating here, and eventually over time you'll start to see um, that profile migrate upward. It'll happen quite slowly. I'll do yellow for some kind of intermediate. So we'd start to see this kind of thing happening. Yellow is probably a pretty bad choice of color, but over time you'll start to see that temperature profile migrate upward. The flux profile will not be flat. There is going to be a lot of heat transfer happening um, because our system is not at thermal equilibrium in between these two phases. So that brings me to the last question. As the system transitions from one steady state to another, where is the heat going? So prior to this, in examples, we've talked about heat flowing through the system. And when you have a plane wall, especially at steady state with constant thermal conductivity, we've discovered that heat would flow consistently from one side of your system to the other. So uh, now, when you're in this transient, you're going to have heat flowing from left to right on the left side of the wall, and you're going to have heat flowing from right to left on the right side of the wall, and this diagram shows that the heat is coming from opposite directions. You see that heat coming from the edges and penetrating into the middle. So the heat's not going uh, from one side of the room, or from one room to the other room. That heat is going somewhere, so it's being absorbed somewhere. So specifically, where is the heat going? And I've mentioned uh, before, the reason we could use the thermal resistance method for steady state systems is because we can assume that heat is coming from a source and it's going to a sink. And the, if the flow of heat is constant from source to sink along our coordinate system, then we can use this thermal resistance method. And it's all predicated on assuming that that flow of heat is constant in one direction. Well, here it's definitely not going to be constant with respect to x. We're going to have a positive flow of heat and a negative flow of heat. So a positive flow of heat on the left side of our system and a negative flow of heat on the right side of our system. So that heat has got to be going somewhere. So specifically, that heat is going to be going into the accumulation term. So now, we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, but that energy is going to be being accumulated or absorbed by our system now. So it's no longer passing through our system. Now it's being absorbed along the way. And specifically, it's going into the sensible heat of the wall itself. So I've coded a simulation for this oak wall, where K, our thermal conductivity, is 0.17 watts per meter Kelvin. That's a relatively small thermal conductivity. Density is 750 kilograms per meter cubed. And then our heat capacity is 2,000 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And if you recall, in the heat equation, our accumulation term always has that rho CP, and then we have volume if if we're talking about the absolute energy rate times dt dt. So our accumulation term uh, certainly has a volume, but we often think of this rho CP and sometimes the V term as the thermal mass of our system. So that thermal mass of our system basically tells us how much capacity does this have for energy storage. These three terms together tell us how fast the state of energy is changing with our system. So a system that has thermal mass can store a lot more energy with a lot smaller temperature derivative. The temperature would be changing a lot more slowly because that it just has a capacity to absorb that much more heat as a function of its density and heat capacity. So I've coded up a Python simulation where I've numerically, I'm numerically integrating the heat equation so that we can see how the temperature profile evolves over time. And you'll notice, again, one thing we haven't covered so far is what happens over time. We've always talked about one steady state. Um, 
but we've never talked about the transition from one steady state to another and this is already a couple of seconds into the simulation so let's just watch what happens in this particular circumstance and this is with a convective heat transfer coefficient of h equals 20 watts per meter squared per kelvin so you can see as we suspected we do that heat starts to penetrate here at the edges because this plot is only covering the solid so we have if we covered the air we're going to have temperature at 30 and we're going to have this delta t and that driving force between the air and our wall surfaces is going to create a flow of heat it, from right from left to right on the left hand side and then from right to left on the right hand side so it takes a while for that heat to propagate down to the center but as we see the temperature here rise that creates a temperature gradient and so the creation of that temperature gradient remember heat flows downhill so uh, we can we can see that heat's going to be flowing toward the center from, from the left to the center and then also from the right to the center and that matches up very well with our flux and we would calculate flux so we solve the heat equation then we can calculate flux just as we always have it's minus k dt dx so we can see that on the left hand side there is a positive flow of heat and that just means that heat is flowing with our coordinate system so that definitely confirms what we're seeing over here on the right hand side we see a negative flow of heat if there's our zero we see that heat is negative and that doesn't necessarily mean anything different except it's just the way we've defined our coordinate system so here we have heat negative flow of heat which just means we're if heat is flowing from the right into the center so as you can see we are now almost two hours into our simulation one thing that you'll observe is that it starts moving very quickly at the beginning but then it moves slower and slower the deeper you go into the simulation so ultimately we're expecting a temperature profile that looks like this so why is it getting slower and slower why are these lines no longer moving very quickly well that's because as it approaches thermal equilibrium see now that temperature driving force for convection is much smaller than it was and as this uh, curve gets shallower and shallower then heat transfer slows down what we expect to happen eventually on the flux as we thought about in our thought experiment is we ex eventually expect this to flatten out all the way to zero and what you see is uh, this takes quite a long time so here we are nearly three hours into the simulation and we still have fairly substantial temperature gradients okay so if we can kind of uh, fast forward through this system I'll try and take so we don't have to watch the entire video you can see how that temperature profile evolves over time and again you see it going from that really deep U shape getting flatter and flatter which is going to make our flux curve less and less steep and we do see our curve starting to approach that new thermal equilibrium at 30 degrees and even after seven and a half hours we're still not quite there yet but we're pretty close so you can see that this is going to take a lot of time and it's only going to asymptotically approach the steady state slash thermal equilibrium temperature of 30 degrees okay now part two of this thought experiment I'm gonna ask all of the same questions except we are going to replace the oak wall with a steel wall so uh, I hope your intuition is telling you that steel conducts heat a lot better than something like oak if you were if it were a cold day and you were standing in your house and you touched the inside of an oak wall you may not feel that cold of a temperature but if you have steel walls you might go up and touch your steel wall from the inside and it might feel very cold because that heat is going to propagate through um, much better and require a lot less of a driving force for heat to come through another way of saying that would be that oak has a higher thermal resistance and it's a better insulator whereas steel because of its higher thermal conductivity would have a lower thermal resistance so you could get the same amount of heat through with a far smaller temperature gradient or a temperature driving force so we have the same building it's at five degrees C you suddenly turn on the heat in each room to 30 so now if we have a steel wall how do the temperature and flux profile look at T equals zero hours so 
I'm not even going to pause for this one. They would look the same as they did before. We would expect thermal equilibrium here, and we would just have T is equal to 5 degrees C all the way through our system. Because T is just flat, there's no slope, there's no driving force, then our flux is just going to be zero all the way through. Okay, if we waited two days and we were at T equals 48 hours, uh, we're going to get the same thing. So we're going to get that our temperature at 48 hours just reaches 30 degrees C or, or really close. Again, we'd expect flux to just be flat because even though it's a higher temperature thermal equilibrium, it's still a thermal equi equilibrium. There are no temperature gradients and therefore no driving force for heat transfer. Okay, so now it gets a little bit more interesting. So what happens at T equals 10 minutes? So I want you to stop and think about this one a little bit. So at T equals 10 minutes, what kind of temperature profile are we expecting to see relative to the oak wall, which has a much lower thermal conductivity? So what you're going to see happen is that at T equals 10 minutes, we're going to see a much shallower U-shape because that heat, while it will still convect into those outer walls, once it gets into the steel, it's going to propagate through very quickly. That much higher thermal conductivity of the steel is going to propagate through and it's going to keep that temperature profile flatter and flatter. However, we would still expect our flux profile to look something like this, even though we don't have... so. Um, we don't have the same kind of temp steep temperature gradients, but we don't need them because we have a much higher thermal conductivity. So we can still achieve quite high flux in, for a steel wall without needing a huge temperature driving force. Okay, so then again, the same thing is happening. As the system, tra system transition from one steady state to another, you're still going to get heat flowing in from each direction. So it's not going from point A to point B, uh, in terms of room one to room two, it's going from point A into this wall where it's being absorbed or accumulated in the sensible heat of the wall. And the temperature of the wall is going to tell us how much heat has gone in or how much how much thermal energy or heat is being stored in our steel wall at any given time. Okay, so let's look at the simulation. So notice the parameters. The thermal conductivity of our oak wall was 0.17. So for the steel wall, it's more than 100 times greater at 30 watts per meter Kelvin as opposed to 0 0.17 for the oak wall. The steel is quite a bit more dense, so the steel wall is about 10 times more dense than the oak, and then the thermal, the heat capacity is not quite as high as for the oak wall. But I've got the simulation queued up, so let's go ahead and look. So our suspicions uh, were have been confirmed that this temperature profile stays relatively flat. And I do want to point out that uh, I had to run the simulation more slowly here to capture everything that was happening. So time in that previous simulation doesn't necessarily go at the same rate as time in this simulation. But as you can see, we do have heat. So now we have convection happening here. So there is a definite driving force for heat transfer as heat convects in from this temperature down to our edge temperature, which is currently at about 7. So we do have this nice delta T, which is going to drive convective heat into the outer walls of our system, and that's going to happen on both sides. However, notice that uh, there aren't, at least at this scale, you don't really even see a noticeable temperature gradient. If you look closely, there definitely is a temperature gradient going this way and going this way, but you don't really see it. However, if you notice, the flux is still quite high so even with that very small driving force, you can still have a lot of heat flow through your system. So we definitely see this really steep change in flux. We have uh, heat coming from left to right into the center of our system and from right to left into the center of our system, but we don't necessarily see those large temperature gradients required for that heat transfer. The steel, In other words, the steel wall has a high enough thermal conductivity that heat propagates through it pretty easily without needing huge uh, huge temperature gradients. However, things are still moving pretty slowly because our steel still has quite a large capacity to absorb heat. That the thermal mass of it is still quite a bit high. I believe it's I believe it's nearly 
double, I think it's around double the thermal mass of the oak wall, but I'd have to verify. So I'm going to skip through the simulation and you can see what happens. So you can see that steel wall temperature, it stays pretty flat, but you can see that it kind of gradually rises all together. The flux profile, you notice that as the steel temperature gets closer to ambient, our driving forces are reduced. So that flux pro profile starts to flatten out. And ultimately, at steady state, we would see a completely flat profile. But here we are now, nearly four hours into the simulation. We're not quite seeing that happen. But if we kept this going for several more simulation hours, we would see that that flux profile gradually flattens out. So this is really just a conceptual introduction. I wanted you to think through what might be happening in a transient system because that's going to whet your appetite for how to analyze these types of problems. I want to finish this lecture with some thought questions. So we're, the way that I got these solutions is by solving the heat equation, which you have seen. So this is the heat equation in Cartesian coordinates. So specifically, which version of the heat equation have we just solved? I didn't talk about this much as we were thinking about the problem and solving it. So hopefully you're getting pretty good at this by now. You know that we are concerned with temperature variations in the x direction, but we're not assuming anything happens in the y or the z direction. In other words, the height or the width of the wall. We're only considering what's happening as a function of depth through the wall. We didn't think about generation within the wall itself, so we can nix the generation term. However, we are definitely thinking about this accumulation term. So there is our thermal mass of the system, or at least our relative thermal mass of the system, and our collectively that makes up our accumulation term. So that if we were to reduce that equation down a little bit more, we would see that it takes on this form. And if this is if you have a constant thermal conductivity. Remember, you can pull k out of the derivative in that case. So we define this new term alpha, which is the thermal diffusivity of our material. So alpha is defined as the thermal conductivity over the density times the heat capacity. So basically what we've done is we've just lumped those terms together by dividing both sides of the equation by rho Cp. And we pulled k out and we divided through by those. Okay, so this thermal diffusivity is the ratio of the time derivative to curvature with respect to x. Okay, so how is that physically meaningful for us? So you definitely notice the big differences in the oak and the steel. So notice the differences in magnitude. These are very small numbers and so it's a little bit hard to get your head wrapped around them. So oak has a thermal diffusivity. It has units of meters squared per second. The thermal diffusivity for the oak, and I'm just taking k divided by rho Cp, is 1.13 times 10 to the minus 7. For steel, it is 7.8 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so they don't seem all that different. They're both really small numbers, and you may get fixated on the 6 isn't all that different from 7. However, this is actually more than an order of magnitude bigger. So the steel is actually about 70 times bigger than the oak. So it has a much higher thermal diffusivity. So if you notice, the steel, relatively speaking, they ch the, the change in temperature with respect to time was comparable for the two. We didn't really study which one was moving faster and we had different simulation times. Um, but you notice that the steel with this much higher thermal diffusivity um, meant that the change in temperature, so what's going to drive our system so if you looked at, if here's our wall, for an individual element of that system, let's say we took a, a node out of the section of our wall, its change in temperature is going to be relative to how much energy is coming in versus how much energy is going out. So let's say a lot of energy is going in, represented by a really steep slope because of Fourier's law, and not a lot of energy is going out or relatively less energy is going out. Let's make that a little shallower. So you notice this curvature here. So, it, so it's really the curvature of that line that will determine how fast energy is being accumulated in your system. So if you have a really steep curvature, um, that means more energy is coming in. Well, so if you have a steep curvature coming in and shallower curvature going out, that means energy is coming in faster than it's going out, which is going to drive how much fast energy is being accumulated. I hope this explanation is making sense. But basically, because the steel has this much higher thermal diffusivity, its temperature can increase 
without requiring these big driving forces. Um, it doesn't need a big difference um, in curvature because it has this higher thermal diffusivity. Whereas for the wood, this number is much smaller, so we saw this much higher curvature for, relatively speaking, about the same change in temperature with respect to time. And I, I don't know off the top of my head which of those actually happens faster. Um, but we're going to talk about that in our next lecture. So what conditions do we need to know to solve this? So what conditions do we need to know to solve this? So we need boundary conditions. So when we solve that equation, we've done a lot with boundary conditions. So the heat equation, if you're just looking at one dimension, is second order with respect to that one dimension. So we need two boundary conditions, just like always. In that particular demonstration, we had fixed, well, we had convection boundary conditions happening on both sides. We had that 30 degree air up against what was initially five degree wall, but we always had that uh, boundary condition. But the rate of flux changed over time because our temperature driving force changed as the wall heated up. So just like you're used to, we need to have two boundary conditions. What other types of conditions do we have? So now we're no longer solving just a spatial problem. Now we're solving this temporal problem that changes with time. It's a transient problem. So now we need an initial condition. So I sort of gave you that initial condition when I was telling you, OK, we let the wall sit for a really long time. It was at 5 degrees C. So in order to figure out how the temperature profile of the system is changing with time, we first need to know what's the temperature profile of the system at the beginning. So our initial condition for this particular system would be we need to know what T looks like for all X and at time zero. So we need to define that entire line at time zero. And that was just T equals five degrees at the beginning. So in addition to needing boundary conditions, when you solve transient problems, you also need initial conditions. So here is another thought question. What if we didn't have to worry about dt dx? That steel system actually became kind of boring. It was just a flat line, and you were just watching that flat line rise. So you could make the assumption that, well, we don't really care about what dt dx is. We don't care about how temperature changes with, with space. And not so much that we don't care about it, but could we just assume it to be constant, that dt dx is just 0? So are there approximations that we could make? So which system parameters would tell us if we can make this assumption or not? So certainly K, the steel wall had that much, much higher thermal conductivity, so temperature propagated through it much quicker. But also what matters is going to be L, the total thickness of the wall. If the wall were 10 meters thick, which is super duper thick, it would obviously, you would definitely see a, some temperature gradients in there. You would see a more pronounced temperature profile because everything you're doing is spaced out over a really large width. And what we'll also see will matter is how fast is energy getting into our system by convection. And the idea of thermal resistances will play into how we determine if we can make this approximation. So we're going to be using something called the lumped capacitance method for these specific instances. So depending on the values of these parameters, we'll be able to make this simplifying assumption, where actually what we'll be doing is we'll be get rid all of, of all of those terms, but we'll actually be getting rid of this term and replacing that with just a total energy stored as if it's all at uniform temperature. So we're going to develop how do we do that. So instead of a one-dimensional system, we're actually going to be dealing with zero-dimensional systems because we're assuming that temperature throughout our entire solid is all the same. So stay tuned for those upcoming lectures where we're going to dive a little bit more into depth into um, how you do analysis of transient systems like this.